And so you have to understand that there's, um, there's a muscle here. Like this is your arm. <laughs> this is your collarbone. I'm telling you, this is really amazing. That's one big boob. <laughs> it's really a square boob, right? All right, don't make fun. Don't no, make, don't sorry, make fun. it looks great. <laughs> So I'm here with Dr. Michelle Routon, one of our surgeons at Amelia Aesthetics, and I have a bunch of questions for you from Bus Mob and Eden Nose Implants and Amelia Aesthetics. We have been asking a ton of questions, so I'm going to ask them to you, and it's going to be great. All right. You ready? Social distance questions. I'm ready. Yeah. No okay. pressure. Ready? No pressure. Okay. <clears throat> These are going to be all over the spectrum. We're going to be talking about tummy tucks, breast lifts, implants what your favorite pizza topping is. My pizza topping. Okay. Pizza topping. Okay, so we'll start there. Both surgeons love to talk about themselves, so you go ahead. Okay. So one question someone said was, what is your favorite pizza topping? So it kind of varies. Um, before children, our favorite pizza topping was sausage and jalapeno, the thin crust from Giordano's. But now, of course, no one will eat anything that's spicy. Um, so we've gone to a cheese pizza, if we got to share with them. And we generally do like half and half. And then probably mushrooms are my favorite if I had to pick any one. Oh. My husband hates mushrooms on pretty much anything, but he'll, he'll eat them if they're on pizza or if they're like mixed in with like a Chinese dish where it's like okay. it's just super sticky and sweet. Okay. And he will not eat a mushroom, but I love mushrooms. Now, do you um, like fresh mushrooms? Cause my husband likes those and I particularly, I'm like, I, this doesn't have a flavor. Mmm, what'd like you put in it? Salad. They're like little well, like spinach salad. Would you eat mushrooms just dry or raw, chopped up in a spinach salad? It's not my favorite. Yeah, I don't know why he likes that. I'm always, I think we should cook them. I'm a fan yeah. of cooked mushrooms, just for the reason that they absorb all the butter and oil and salt. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, and balsamic vinegar. Mm-hmm. And garlic. Okay. Okay, we're right. not, it's, lunch is over, Jenny. Okay. <laughs> we're going to pivot from food. <laughs> talk about plastic surgery. <laughs> okay, so I like this one. I love that you've had a breast augmentation and you're a plastic surgeon, so you can really speak to like, yeah, it's going to be like this. Unlike if you ask a male surgeon and they say it, it's like, hmm, you know, maybe based on experience from other people, but not you, but you can do that. So tell me about your breast augmentation. Um, well, I was doing mostly breast cancer work as a plastic surgeon. And I had this realization after my second child, who you just met, the fussy, angry one, <laughs> that my breasts honestly like didn't look as good as a lot of the reconstructions that I was doing. And I thought, this has really got to change. Like, I, I can't. And I don't know if it's the same for you when you had your surgery, but it was, um, there were years. I mean, I thought about that for years since I was 16, you know? Um, but I just, it went from like something in the back of my mind to urgent to like, it's a full fledged emergency. <laughs> um, so I contacted a friend of mine um, and said, hey, I want to travel. I want to do this. And he said, come on down. So I was supposed to go. My surgery was on Friday morning. I was supposed to go Thursday night. Um, my flight got canceled. So I took the first flight out Friday morning, had surgery mid-morning. Um, and spent two nights in a hotel and flew home Sunday and worked on Monday. Um, from a pain perspective, I didn't think it was that bad, honestly. I felt like my milk had come in. Like I felt full and sore, but certainly not, um, I mean, it didn't keep me from working three days later, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but that was just kind of how my life had shaken up at the time. Mm -hmm. I like that. So I, another lady asked an interesting question. I didn't write it down, but I kind of remember it. So she has larger implants now, but she liked to downsize them, like considerably yeah. smaller. And she was wondering, will I have loose skin if I do that? And if so, what are my options? That's a great question. And it's so rare, honestly, um, that I get that. It's much more common for women to say, I've always wanted to go a little bit bigger. Can I go a little bit bigger now? Um, so I think it depends on several things. So it depends on how much smaller. And I know you said a lot smaller. And of course, like, it, it's hard to know. Mm -hmm. um, I think it depends on if they're silicone or saline. I think it depends on her age and more specifically how elastic her skin is. 
Um, if she has saline implants, what I would say is the smartest thing to do would be to rupture the implants on purpose in the office. Like, let me, let me deflate the implant. Um, and then we'll just leave that shell in there. Like that wouldn't be surgery, just in the office, come in, it wouldn't hurt, tiny little needle. Um, and your body will reabsorb the saline. And then let's see how much your breasts shrink back down over a period of say six weeks. Mm -hmm. And then at six weeks, we could think about going to sleep, taking out the implant and putting in a new implant that would be smaller. The reason you need to be asleep for that is that we'd almost certainly need to make that pocket a little bit smaller surgically. And that can be uncomfortable to say the least um, if you do that awake. I've done it, but um, it's not my, not my preference. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that she'll just shrink back and that'll be fine. And then we can put in a smaller implant and get her happy. The other thing that's possible is that you don't shrink as much as you want, or you have a gel implant, and except for having surgery to take it out. There's no kind of fast way to see what you would look like. Um, and sometimes those women need a, need a breast lift, especially if they want their nipple to be really perky. Just depends on how elastic the skin is. Mm, okay. A good answer. I like that because I always wondered that too. Because mine are six hundred, so I'm like, what if I wanted to do? I don't, but what if I wanted to do three hundred? You know. So it's nice knowing that you have an option. It's not like a hard and set. Like, yes, you have to get a lift if you. Oh, no. the you know, the thing is like the one cool part, and also can be stressful for sure. But about um, breast implant surgery, it's not like, or really any plastic surgery, it's not like appendicitis. You know, you don't either have surgery or die. Um, there's nothing that you have to do. Um, said in a different way, my mother had really bad capsular contracture with her implants. And <clears throat> I sent her to see my old partners in Chicago. And I said, hey, can you please help my mom? And we all looked at her photographs and we were like, she needs a lift with a new pair of implants. <clears throat> my mom was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not having scars on my breasts. <laughs> we, you know, we were like, mom, no, you're crazy. Like you need you need to have this done. And she was like, I'm 60 years old. Like, I'm okay if my nipple is lower than it was when I was 25. And she's very happy and she doesn't look bad. She just looks like her nipple's low on her <laughs> breast. <clears throat> I don't stare at my naked mother very often, but <laughs> I didn't want to like lead you astray. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was a good story. <laughs> <laughs> I like that your mom has implants too. I didn't oh, yeah. know that. Oh yeah, she had implants put in in the 80s, right? And then she had, then they ruptured, and then she had saline implants put in, and then they were, anyway, I think she's on like her fourth set now, because she started back in the 80s when they just weren't as good of products as they are now. <clears throat> Next question. Okay, shoot. Someone has like fibrous breasts. Um, I've heard that Women will ask me sometimes, like, is it safe for me to get implants? Is it still a possibility? Is there any issues if I do have, like, dense fibrous breasts? Yeah, you can totally still have breast implants. Um, and the good part about that is that we're not operating inside the breast. It sounds like we are, and it looks like we are, but truly when we talk about over the muscle or under the muscle, we're either talking about behind the breast, the whole breast, or behind the breast plus the muscle. We're never talking about an implant that sits within the gland itself. Which is why, for the same reason, you should be able to breastfeed, and I did after implants, um, because we're not disturbing the architecture of the breast. Um, you can get mammograms after breast implants. Uh, it won't affect the rate of cancer detection or the rate at which you would get breast cancer. It's really an operation that makes the breast look bigger because it's behind the breast. Mm. So if you want to get breast implants, should you wait until after you have kids or should you get them before kids, especially if you don't know when you want to have them? So I lived this and if I could change one thing, I would have had my implants done about a decade before I did <laughs> because I kept thinking, oh, I'll do it after I have kids. But God, I was so old by the time I had my children. Like I still have a one year old. Um, so I, I actually, I think I just told you, but I had two kids and then I had my implants and then I got pregnant like a year later within a year. I mean, literally I was like, I can't, I mean, I knew I wanted a third kid. There's never a good time. Um, <laughs> and nobody's body looks as good as it did 10 years ago or very, very few people because over time gravity takes effect. I would say like, there's no perfect time. And if you put it off for decades, all you're going to wish is that you've done it before. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, 
very few people, I can't think of anybody that has told me, man, I wish I'd never had breast implants. Like that's usually not a thing. It's a really high patient satisfaction operation. Um, so I would say if you're actively trying to get pregnant, that it's not a good time. But like you said, if you just want kids in the future, do your boobs now. Like yeah. be happy, live life. That's what I did. Um, I didn't have Hazel, <clears throat> my daughter, until she was, till I was uh, 29. And I had my implants at 25 because like it wasn't even on the horizon. Like we were still right. debating, are we going to have kids? Not when are we going to have kids? Right. Well, I'm like, well, I'm going to have the boobs now. And then I'm not even going to think about it until after I have my, my child. And then we'll worry about the consequences. <laughs> but for right. me, like I didn't need, like a lot of people need a lift after they breastfeed, but my supply was so low but there was no way of knowing like yours is going to be low. Yours is going to be for twins. Like that's true too. And I, it's not actually ever been shown how much you breastfeed makes a difference. It seems like it should. And I get that. And people always tell me, Oh my God, like this breast is so big. Cause this is the one the baby liked. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard to answer all those things, but I think waiting 20 years because you might want to have children doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What if you're under 22 and you want to get silicone implants? Is it safe? Um, it's safe. And I, and I recommend it because they are essentially just so much better of a product. They last longer, feel more natural, look more natural. No offense. I know you have saline. But <laughs> I'm getting silicone this year, so uh, no offense taken. Oh, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> the problem that I see it is only that the, it invalidates the warranty. So that like awesome warranty, for instance, with Sientra, that's 20 years for capsular contracture. Well, it, they won't give you new implants for that, mostly because they don't have to. Um, they say it's off label, which it technically is. I just can't understand like what happens at age 22 that you become able to make a decision that you couldn't make at 21. Like obviously that's some random number. So if you come and see me and you're 21 and a half, I would say wait six months because then you were warranty so much better and you had to wait six months. Mm -hmm. If you come and see me and you're 19 and this is something you've always wanted and you're in a position to do it, I don't think you would, should wait three years to get the silicone implant. I would just do this silicone implant. Again, because I just think it's a better implant. Um, I have a hard time wanting to use saline unless the patient really wants it. You said Sientra specifically. Is that just Sientra or is it also with Allergan implants? Um, Allergan has a 10-year warranty for the same thing. And to be honest, the warranties are long and I have not memorized them. And I leave that to my patient care coordinators because they're mm -hmm. amazing. But my understanding is that with Sientra, you don't just get two new free implants, but some money towards the second surgery. And I'm not sure how that plays out with Allergan and their warranty. In general, I know the implant warranty is 10 years versus 20 uh, for capsular contracture. And but if you're under 22, it's yeah, still... Yeah, sorry. No, yeah, that's, okay. that's an across-the-board thing. Okay, so no matter what implant manufacturer it is, under 22, you're voiding your contract. Voiding the warranty, yeah. Warranty, if you get silicone. Correct. Yeah. Okay, let's go to profiles. Okay, oh, well, no, not profile. Okay. <laughs> So I know low profiles aren't popular and they're probably rarely used, the AKA the pancake, but when would be a good opportunity for someone to have one? Cause I've seen them out there like every now and then they're like, I have low profile and I'm like, do you mean moderate? And they're like, no low profile. And I'm like, okay, but why would she be a candidate for low profile as opposed to something else? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I get a lot of questions about profile. Like you heard me say like, no, not the profile. <laughs> um, so you're right. Low profile, rarely used. Um, I can think of a few scenarios. So if a patient came to see me and she was 5'11 and she wanted 225 cc breast implants. If I were to look at her base diameter, so from her uh, breastbone, to this uh, fold right here at the arm, so what I would call anterior axillary line, that's gonna be relatively wide, wider than if you're 4'11", right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a foot taller, you're probably a couple, three centimeters wider. If you don't want much volume, I've still got to fill that space. Like you don't want an implant this wide and a breast that's this wide. That is not gonna be sexy time. <laughs> so we want them to be close. 
Um, and so for her, and she's going to be taller too. So like her nipple is going to be the nipple to fold distance, the distance from the collarbone to the nipple to the crease, all that's going to be longer. So she might be a good candidate for a lower profile implant. Um, again, more like a pancake than a snow globe. Mm-hmm. Um, also, there are women that um, are getting lifts and they have a fair amount of their own breast volume. I think about using a lower profile in that woman because her own breast is going to give her the projection. And if she wants to fill this up, this space here, then I might want a taller implant. Yes, they're round. So tall also means wide. So you have to be thoughtful about height versus side boob, so to speak. Um, what I try to caution all my patients is that please, please, you pick the volume and then we'll look at the profile together. Or you can let me pick the profile. Mm-hmm. Um, because, and if you do look at those charts, they're literally just a millimeter or two different for any one volume. So it's not going to be, let me say it differently. Volume is going to be the biggest determination of height and width. It's going to be volume more so than profile. Okay. Like, what about, we're going to switch gears. Someone asked about cellulite. What is oh. a good way to reduce the visible appearance of cellulite? So do you know what cellulite is? It's like... I do, but... You do. They <laughs> like that. <laughs> So it's <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> so if this is the surface skin and this is the muscle beneath, there are like these little um, attachments between the skin and the muscle beneath that can make it look cobblestone. Like if this part is stuck down and then this part's not, then instead of being a straight line, it's lumpy bumpy. And your genetics, unfortunately, play the biggest part in cellulite, um, whether you have it or not. There are... Um, at different weights, you may notice it more, but it doesn't mean it's either there or not. <clears throat> so you can imagine that if you have these little connections, but then you really, really, really stress that, that now they're under more stretch, the little connections. And so then you have more bumpies than if you are thinner and they're not under stretch. So one way to help cellulite is to lose weight, um, but that doesn't work for everybody. Number one, losing weight is a lot easier said than done. And number two, it may not actually cure your cellulite. So the way to make that as good as possible, besides acceptance, which is also one possible um, way to do it, and to um, also just give yourself some grace and know that celebrities are all airbrushed, (laughs) is that liposuction can help by virtue of trying to break up some of those um, connections. Although liposuction may not be, it's not quite as good as something called selfina, but in conjunction with each other they may be the best way what's that phone was like ding it's my it's my dinging of my email on my laptop i'm telling you this is for i don't know how to turn that off <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, moving on the cellulite um you've got to break the connections between the two selfina is this cool thing it's like a suction cup and then it's you put in knowing medicine you suction cup up the area. You've already marked where the cobblestoning areas are. And then literally needles come in at different depths to break them up, to separate the skin layer from the muscle layer and to divide those connections. Now, selfina doesn't do anything about the fat. So oftentimes it's like a combination of liposuction, selfina, acceptance. Um, there is no magic wand. I wish there were. Um, but it, and it also kind of depends on the area as to its likelihood of responding well. What area has a better likelihood of responding? Like the butt area? <clears throat> so the butt can be good. The banana roll, that area under the butt is a tough one to treat. Um, that is not an area that responds well to selfina or to liposuction. I feel like that's the place where most people would probably want it. I know. And that's why I went to grace and acceptance. <laughs> it's like option C. I know. C. All right. So if I had a lift with my breast augmentation, can I still go bigger down the road or switch profiles? I guess mm-hmm. they're thinking maybe like the lift, like readjust the breast in a certain way. I don't know. What do you yeah, yeah, I mean, of course you can change your implants. Um, you can change your implants anytime. I would just have a really thoughtful conversation ahead of time as to what your goals are. Um, 
what I have done um, is actually redo the lift like a breast reduction and increase the implant volume. Because when I hear that, my immediate thought is, I bet this is a patient who wanted to look more round, more like breast implants than like a natural breast. I bet she feels like she's too natural looking. And the only way to fix that is to change that ratio of how much breast tissue you have left and how big your implants are. So if you go up a little bit on the implant and down a little bit on the breast, then the overall look is closer to what she wants. Oh, I like that. Because I do hear a lot of times, um, I really want an augmented look, but I can. it seems like they have a hard time getting there because of how much breast tissue they have naturally. That's absolutely the trick. Absolutely the case. Absolutely true. So you and could what, actually have a little bit, could you, I've heard this too, can you liposuction the breast? You can, but the problem with that is when you're young, and I'm still considering myself quite young, so let's say 40 and under. Okay. <laughs> um, they, you. Um, you have more gland than fat and the only thing that comes out in the liposuction cannula is fat so you mentioned earlier a woman with fibrocystic breast or dense breast that's not a good breast to liposuction you can try but nothing really comes out of it whereas if you're 60 most of that gland after menopause has been replaced with fat and so then that breast is much more amenable to liposuction so it's one of those things that it's just there's no magic wand for it. Okay. Magic liposuction cannula. <laughs> what about, I've seen sometimes on some women's breasts, they have like kind of a hard line where you can see where their breast tissue kind oh, of ends. Double bubble? Yeah, but the other side's smooth and it's almost like it's not, I guess that's what it is. It's just where you see that where the breast tissue ends and where the implant yeah. keeps going. <laughs> Does it look something like that? Yeah, but it's kind of like flat too, almost like the but little the second bubble. Yeah, that's the old breast. That's the old crease. How do you get rid of that? Uh, well, that's <laughs> it. Can, friend. I know it. Magic wand number oh, one. Oh, is that uh, what I need? One of those. Yeah, I mean, duh. No. So <laughs> part of it when we go like, let's say this is where you started and this is where you want to be. When we do this crease incision down here we're disrupting some of the fold. Simply by the nature that we need to get an implant in here, we're breaking up some of the fold. If it's a really tight fold, and you see this more commonly with tuberous breasts than anything else, is that when you're in there, when you're in the operating room, from the underneath part, so now I'm looking with a retractor, I'm holding the breast up and I'm looking underneath, I can try to cut some of these white fibers to relax them a little bit. Then by the nature of this implant being three-dimensional and pushing out against the breast, it will soften some with time. This is usually most noticeable when you raise your arm up because the breast is actually connected with um, what we call ligaments. I don't know if they're truly ligaments, but some ligaments to the arm. So as you raise your arms up, you're putting your breast under stretch and not your implants. So you can often see double bubble the worst with the arms up. Um, that's a weird position to be in naked in public. So if that's the only time I know, <laughs> if you're walking around like that naked in public, I, I don't know, it's a harder one to, to get rid of. Um, generally that's the place it's the most seen, um, is with your arms up naked. What if, would you be more likely to see it with like a saline versus a silicone or a silicone versus saline? Or does it mostly just have to do with the breast tissue? Um, that's a great question. I would say breast tissue much more likely than implant. I, I don't know. I don't know that I can answer that. I also, to be fair, I don't do a ton of saline implants. So, um, yeah, I, I suspect it's all related to patient anatomy or let's say it's 90% patient anatomy and 10% implant type. Okay. Well, we got over here. Let's see. I have my questions right here. Um, oh, Here's a good one. Okay, I can't wait. Question. So when can you have sex after a tummy tuck and a breast lift? Always sex with you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whenever you feel like it is the short answer. Um, with a tummy I, tuck, I feel like it'd be... Oh, it's usually scary. about two weeks before you even feel like you might want to have sex. We generally put you in an uncomfortable, hot, Velcro zipper garment for a week, and if you can have, it's crotchless. Yeah, it's 
<laughs> it is sexy. I mean, if you want to have sex in that, you can. Um, I think you'll probably want to wait a couple of weeks. I don't think the bouncing um, or the use of your core muscle it oh. is going to feel great. Um, it's usually a couple of weeks. And then I tell patients laughingly, but I'm like, and it'll be six months before you can vacuum again. <laughs> All the want to do. <laughs> I let them know they have a pass on that for as long as they need. Nice. Um, doctor's note is needed for that one. Yes. No unloading the dishwasher. Oh, <laughs> I need a tummy tuck. I know, right? I'm a <laughs> soft. <laughs> so great. Let's see. Um, what are the advantages of having a great amount of breast tissue before having in breast augmentation? So I know there's probably a lot of cons, but are, are there any positives to having a good amount of tissue before? Well, you would be less likely to have rippling. Um, because you wouldn't see it. And you think I always tell patients like the princess and the pea, mm -hmm. um, like if you have a comforter over your implant, you won't see the implant imperfections, but if you have a threadbare sheet, you might. So what? some th th threadbare, <laughs> <You're Yeah>. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> like a thin, warm sheet. Oh. Really sheet. That was like some new brand of, I don't know, sheets. I guess I'm just from the sticks, Jenny. <laughs> um, you won't see it as much. So implant imperfections. For really thin women with almost no breast, I strongly encourage them to go under the muscle so they don't, they're not able to see those imperfections. If you have a fair amount of your own tissue, you might be, um, you might be suited to go over the muscle. We'd have a conversation about that. Um, so that might be another advantage. What about dual plane placement? Why would somebody opt for that or be a good candidate for a dual plane placement? And what is a dual plane placement? Those are great questions. Um, a dual plane is Ooh, going are you to- getting the whiteboard? I was thinking about it. I was reaching for it. You saw it. Um, a du God. <laughs> dual plane is going to let the implant come down a little bit. So by doing that, it makes the, it looks like the nipple came up. Not a lot though, like a centimeter. So for my ladies that have a little sag to their breast, um, but don't want to scar, like don't want to have a lift, I'll do a dual plane. But if it gets, if they're very saggy, and I know those aren't great terms, like what is saggy versus very saggy, <laughs> my judgment, um, and then it won't, it doesn't correct enough of it. And then I would say, I don't think it makes sense to put the implant under the muscle. So let me back up a little bit. Implant <clears throat> under the muscle is going to sit where your muscle sits. If your breast sits, if your nipple's down here and your implant's up here, we cannot have two separate humps. That is not sexy. They call it like a waterfall. We're like a waterfall. We're a one hump kind of practice right. per side. So if you're going to get two humps by doing, um, if you're going to get two humps by doing it under the muscle, then I'm going to say we have to go over the muscle if you don't want to lift so that your implant will sit down as far as your breasts do. If you're somewhere in between, um, not at all saggy and a little bit saggy, then I recommend a dual plane, which I'm gonna use my magic whiteboard um, to try to draw this out. And this gets more complicated than it needs to be, so I'm gonna try to make it not, but who knows. <laughs> I've not tried to draw the dual plane before, so there are different levels of a dual plane. Um, and so you have to understand that there's, um, there's a muscle here, like this is your arm, <laughs> this is your collarbone. I'm telling you, this is really amazing. That's one big boob. <laughs> That's really a square boob, right? All right, don't make fun. Don't, no, I'm don't sorry, make... it looks great. So, so, if you don't have any sag at all, and the, on, the ongoing dinging, if you don't have any sag at all, then I'm gonna make a little incision down here, and then I'm gonna make a pocket all under here. I release a little bit of these muscle fibers just to allow the breast to look more round and I put your implant right here, okay? Well, let's say you have a little bit of sag. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna elevate the breast off of the muscle. So all underneath the skin, but I'm gonna elevate this plane separately from the plane I elevate under the muscle. And it gives this a bigger place for the implant to sit. It allows the muscle to come up and the breast to come down. And there's different levels. If I do it to the bottom of the areola, that's dual plane one. If I do it to the level of the nipple, that's dual plane two. And if I do it to the top of the areola, that's dual plane three. 
And the only reason that's important is so I do it the same per side. Or if you have more saggy per side, then I do it more on the saggier side. Hmm. Um, I try to not get people too involved in this because this is not something you can see from the outside. It's just a technique from the inside. <coughs> oh, bless you. Um, it's just a technique from the inside that will help a small amount of sagging. What about that um, bottom booty? Well, I didn't need that one for the elevator. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Okay. I was going to do dual plane one, two, and three, and but then it didn't seem to work. It's tough. It's a tough crowd, bus mom. Let's okay. see the lifts, because I'm okay. excited about seeing those. All right. So, oh, that's not good enough. Hold. Okay. Got my trusty toilet paper, even though there's a shortage to be my eraser. Right. Make sure you save it. <laughs> I have. I've been using the same piece of toilet paper for my eraser for three days. All right. It's getting great. Okay. Don't ask. Okay. Three breast. So three types of lifts. The first type of lift is a donut lift. And I know this seems like the one you want, but it's not. So it seems like it because it's, um, hey, would you like your scar to just be around the areola and nowhere else on the breast? Well, I, I would like that. I, nobody, there's already a color change there. The problem with that is it puts all the tension right on the areola. So you do a donut, hello donut, and then you take out this central part of the breast. You sew in the nipple like a purse string, like you cinch it down, and then that suture gives way, and you end up with a big flat breast with a giant areola on it because ah. it stretches. No, it's horrible. I think it should be outlawed in all plastic surgery. Hmm. I've literally not seen a patient that has this done that comes to see, I mean, I don't do them. So that comes to see me from outside that I think looks good. In fact, I think it's like, Ooh. I'm like, let's fix that. Hmm. The way to fix that is to transition that into a lift that has some other component, like a vertical lift or a, a lollipop lift or an anchor lift. Because what that's doing is it takes that tension off the areola. So um, in this vertical lift, um, like the day of surgery, we would draw this mosque pattern on you. Hmm. The nipple would come up into this circle and then the lines would come together this way so that you would ultimately have a smaller areola and a line down the front of the breast. This is called a vertical or a lollipop. Um, I will tell you that in the first week or so, it looks like the breast is upside down. <laughs> um, and so it took a little while for me to convert to that type of lift because on the operating room table, it looks a little bit terrifying. If you can imagine, <laughs> It does though. If you can imagine this side, this bottom of the breast is tight. So from the side, the bottom of the breast looks tight. Here's your nipple. But because it's tight, you have this upper pole that's accentuated. So it really looks like it would look better if you just did this, right? Um, and that goes away at two weeks. Um, and I'll tell you that it took a little while. When I started at Amelia Aesthetics, I was doing all my lifts like this this is, um, will end up giving you an anchor pattern lift. And one guy retired right when I came and I got to see all his post-op patients. And they looked like this when they came back for the first six weeks and I, you know, I'm a surgeon, so I know everything. <laughs> and in my mind, I didn't say it to them, but I was like, this looks really bad. I know, I don't do it like this. I'm so much smarter. I'll fix this for you, don't worry. So I saw him at one week, I reassured all of them. I saw him at six weeks. This was looking better at six weeks. Like this was like softening up and because this was softer, this was coming down. We started pretty good. <laughs> and by 12 weeks, they looked a lot better than my patients with this lift. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the reason that I was wrong and is that this, where these incisions meet, tends to break down, meaning you have a little open wound there frequently. And I would tell people, oh, don't worry about that. You can just use some ointment, it'll be fine. Well, you can use ointment and it will be fine, but if I could do it a different way where you never had to put ointment on anything, wouldn't that be better if you didn't have an open wound? Like, want an open wound or not? Like, I'd pick not. <laughs> Thank you. The other thing is, inadvertently, these limbs can get kind of long. Meaning like you might, depending upon how long they are, you can start to see them with certain movements or certain clothing. Um, sometimes this outside one creeps up like in a bathing suit, you're in something skimpier and there's a scar. That... So I would favor this 90% of the time. The only time that I would start off with an anchor shape nowadays is if you're very large and want to be small. Because 
when I take off skin in two directions, I'm able to get a bigger change at one time than just taking off skin in one direction. Um, but I do try to control the lengths of the limbs because again, I want you to be able to wear whatever you want without a scar over here on the side that's visible. I like that. Yeah, I prefer not to have a, where when I wear my skimpy clothes, I'd like for it not to be like coming out the side. Absolutely. Really once a year in Mexico, so. Well, that's all right. At least it's still happening. I hit 40. I don't know the last time I wore something skimpy. <laughs> so I'm in my Mr. Rogers sweaters more often than not. Oh my, no, you're not. Do you wear those headbands yeah. that are really cute? Well, I got that, okay. Because the girls in the office are cute, and so it holds me to like a higher personal standard. Yeah, and your high waisted pants that are like that coral color. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. They were, <laughs> they were what? They were on sale. <laughs> I don't care if they're on sale or cute. All right, next. All right, what else you got? Let's see. What is your favorite cosmetic procedure to perform in the operating room? Oh, I love the tummy tuck. I love it. Here's why. I'm immediate gratification kind of surging. So I absolutely love two parts of it. I love putting the muscles back together because when you're asleep, I see this huge gap between and it may, I just I have a big, just big suture and I just like to put it back together. I feel like it's just doing the right thing for the world. And you'll recall that, however, you're basically like a corset on the inside. So if the front, if the muscles are split apart five centimeters, just by putting the muscles back together and doing nothing else, you went from like a rectangular waist to more of an hourglass waist. Mm. So I love that. Um, but even better is at the end when I cut off all the extra skin and I just get to discard it. Like, I love that. That thing that you've been pinching, it's been bothering you for a decade. Like, I just throw that away and it makes me very happy. Is that where um, the, wand, the, the wand comes into play? It's like, the skin. That would be even better. If I can figure out how to do it without a scar, I'll be the first one to sign up. <laughs> I'm still trying to sign up. I just can't figure out a good time to be off work. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and to be honest, I'm not really psyched about taking my clothes off in front of people that I work with. Oh, we've all done it. I'm, I'm getting over that. No, I know. No, I know. You're right. I just have to man up. Woman up. <laughs> Doctor up. Something up. like that. Woman up. That's right. Next, I uh, already asked you your pizza one. Hybris breast. Oh, okay. What are some options for people who might have a double chin and they're just really unhappy with this area right here? Okay, this is the best thing I found out in the last year. I'm going to share it with you. A three millimeter incision right here gets rid of all of that. I don't know. It's now that I spend all this time on Zoom too, I'm like, oh, buddy, is this, I do I need it? I know. Well, don't do that. First of all, you got to learn to position the camera. So that's the first step for your chin is the camera should be above you looking down. Okay, after that, if it's still there, <laughs> never film from below. That's okay. true. I need to get higher. Number, one. Number two <laughs> is a tiny little incision with you awake. We put in a bunch of numbing medicine through here and the numbing medicine not only makes it numb, obviously, but it also makes the blood vessels constrict down. And then we use a tiny little three millimeter metal straw thing. You can't feel it because you're numb. Um, and we just take the fat out and it's probably like three tablespoons of fat max. And it makes a dramatic difference. I think it's twofold. Number one is actually getting rid of the fat, but number two is by doing it, I think it makes the skin shrink a little bit. Like the skin is just a little bit injured from the inside and then it kind of lifts up. Um, my best friend just had it done uh, two weeks ago now, it is, it's just made a dramatic difference. Um, I told a story earlier that I did a girl's breast and her chin and I'd actually forgotten I'd done her chin. I was so excited to see her breast. And I was like, oh man, you've lost so much weight. And she was like, you, you know, you did this a week ago. And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> right. <I did. laughs> Looks great. I was <laughs> like, I'm amazing. It's <laughs> so good. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and I think in this digital world, the more we see ourselves, social distancing, et cetera, the more concerned we are about it. Oh no, I can't hear you. Um, uh, loose skin. Ooh. Okay. We got. Your enthusiasm is amazing. Whoa. We have two more. Okay. okay. So this one is about liposuction. So if someone gets liposuction, will it cause them to have loose skin or like baggy skin? So it can. 
is the short answer. And the longer answer is different areas of the body are more prone to that than others. So one of the areas that's most prone to loose skin is the inner thigh. So we're, I'm always very thoughtful about liposuctioning there. Like I'm not aggressive in that area because you'll be mad at me if it looks worse. Um, if you have a thigh gap, but only because the skin is hanging loose, that isn't a win. Um, on the other hand, this area along the lower back is remarkable for how it shrinks down um, and looks fantastic, like narrows that waist and makes you look like you have this little dip back here. Um, the outside of the thigh, another great place, like in the saddlebag area, fantastic. The chin, fantastic. Um, arms, more tricky. Arms, inner arm is more like the inner thigh. Uh, so again, you just gotta know the area of the body and how much change people want. Um, liposuction is unfortunately not a great weight loss tool. Um, it is more of a change your shape type of tool. So if there's an area in your body that you don't like your shape, you can't change that with diet and exercise. You just grow and shrink in that same shape. The only way to change your shape is by having surgery and permanently removing some fat. Mm. I had someone tell me or ask me the other day, and I had never heard this before, but maybe it's more common than I realized, but they were saying, if I get liposuction, will I be left with like lumps or will it be lumpy? Have you heard that before or is that a thing? Yeah, no, for sure, you can. And again, um, a lot of my colleagues are like, well, you have to see a board certified plastic surgeon, but we're not, it's not impossible that that would happen. What I, even to a board certified plastic surgeon, um, there are a couple of things that we do to minimize that. And what you're talking about is um, swelling and um, contour imperfections. Early on, you're all, everybody's going to have swelling. And every, especially thin people are going to be able to feel where they had it done. And it may even feel ropey or um, it may feel a little bit like little straws or cylinders from where the cannula was passed. Um, when, what I assume you mean is like long term. So a year later, will I be left with hard lumps? Or It's possible. It's rare. Um, at least in my hands, it's rare. What I do to help prevent that is to keep that cannula deep. Um, so there are two layers of fat in the body. There's the superficial layer and then a deep layer. The deep layer is the one next to the muscles and the superficial layer is obviously the one right under the skin. You stay deep and if you do enough surgery, you can tell where you are. Um, and in that deep plane, the reason is because there's a superficial plane on top that you don't touch. So you can get smaller, but not be right up underneath the skin. Um, so uncommon, also healthy people are healthy. So they're less likely to have complications. If you have uncontrolled diabetes or you're morbidly obese or whatever the case may be, um, you're a little bit more likely to have those types of healing complications. Um, so we try to operate selectively on healthy people and then we use relatively small cannulas and we stay deep in order to prevent some of that. Um, it is always possible that you would have some imperfections afterwards um, and many of them, you know, the story is not over the second you wake up. There are ways to make things better as needed. Um, things like scar massage can help early on to speed up some of that healing and lumpiness. Interesting. When I saw Greta getting her inner thigh lipo, well, actually like her trunk too, just she had all kinds of lipo. And when I was watching, I noticed like after there was like the tumescent part, like they puff them up, yep. went in there, sucked it out. And then there was like a, <laughs> it's very technical. And then the last part I remember was like, it was like a vibrating tool almost. And it, does, is that what kind of helps smooth it out? No, but you're not wrong. <laughs> well, there is something called, um, gosh, what is it called? It's, uh, suck something safe liposuction. And it means that after you're finished removing the fat, you go and break everything back up again, just to make sure that you're equalizing the area that you worked in. Um, we also, the, the vibrating thing you saw is called power assisted liposuction. It's just a technique. It's um, less of, the, we still have to do this, but less of that because the tip of it is vibrating. So with each pass, we're able to get more fat out. Hmm. Um, so power assisted means it vi the tip of it vibrates. 
what you probably saw was both pre-tunneling. I guess I left that out. That's true. Um, so before we do the liposuction, so you put the fluid in like you saw. Then before we take the, before we put that cannula on suction, we move the cannula all around to go ahead and start breaking up some of those attachments. Then we put it on suction, then we remove the fat. And then at the end, we go back through and make sure that we broke up as many of those little um, attachments as possible. I don't think so you, that you realize like, how involved liposuction is. Like I thought oh, it was like you stick a cannula in there and just suck it out. And then when I saw yeah, it, all, it's, it's like a portion and then it comes out. Oh no, it's exhausting. It's completely exhausting. Um, it takes a lot of manual labor and it's slow going. Mm -hmm. um, I wish there was something I could like plug myself into and just like deep <laughs> something, but it's not like that. Um, there's a lot of technique about being in the right plane and doing just enough, um, not too much and not too little. One more question. Where was it? Okay. So what if I get this question sometimes and it's a little tricky for me to answer because I'm always like, we need to pick one. But some people are like, I want to have side boob, and I want to have upper pole fullness, and I want cleavage. And I'm like, well, we, we all want it all, but what <laughs> if? <laughs> How do we get that? You pick a breast implant. Well, um, I know, which one? I don't know. It depends on you. It depends on how much breast you start with. Um, and it depends on how big you want to be, which brings me to Vectra. Um, Vectra, as you know, Jenny, uh, we have two in the office. Um, it's standardized photography that takes a picture of you from here to here of your own breasts, naked, of course, um, and then allows the software allows you to add breast implant volume until you get all those things that you're looking for to the amount that you're looking for. Um, implants, the only thing they can't do is touch. That's called semastia or uniboo. But otherwise, as you pick a bigger and bigger volume, they're going to get taller mm -hmm. and wider, right? Because they're round. So most of the time, as long as you're able to select a volume, and, and that's something your surgeon can help you with too, um, you'll, you'll be able to have all of those things just to a varying degree based on size. What if someone's torn between like, I don't know if I want a mod plus or a high profile and maybe their surgeon is leaving the, like, the decision up to them. And I find that really stressful. Um, truly, I do. And I know some of you look at the order sheets, even with me, and you're like, wow, this is a lot. And I'm like, I know it's a lot. But for any one volume, the difference between moderate plus and high profile is a millimeter or two. Like, it's just not that big of a deal. It's big. Um, like this big. It, yeah. Like, may, yeah. Not, not, like a few, nothing. Um, so when I try to counsel you, I, I really do think you should focus more on volume. Um, and then I just use kind of, kind of in my mind, they're kind of common sense measures. Like if you, if you pick 500 and you're four feet 11 versus if you pick 500 and you're five feet 11, you're more likely to need a high profile at four feet 11 than at five feet 11 because your base is gonna be more narrow. Um, your base diameter is going to be more narrow. I generally, I'll just, I mean, I'll tell you how my, I'm not the smartest, right? I'm just a simple plastic surgeon. So I try to work in, in each company. I try to work generally in about two profiles, 95% of the time. I mean, I can think of scenarios that I would want something outside of that. So as you know, Jenny, in our practice, we use mostly Santra and Allergan because they're the only ones on the American market with a highly cohesive or gummy bear implant. Um, so in Allergan, I tend to use either a moderate or a full. I don't use the extra full very often, not in, um, not in aug augmentation. Um, and then in Sientra, I either use the moderate plus or the high. I don't use the extra high. Um, and the reason being that I, I just can't keep five different profiles straight. Like I, <laughs> I, have, to, I have to narrow it down for my simplistic mind. So then I let the patients pick the volume. Um, and if they pick a really high volume, then most likely, because everybody's base diameter, I mean, not everybody, again, I speak in generalizations, but is usually between about 11 and a half and 14. It's just not that different. Um, then it's gonna tell me if they need moderate or high. It's just gonna tell me based on that. So over about 500, I'm generally picking a high, 
under that, I'm generally picking moderate plus. Um, unless women are exceptionally tall, heavy, or short, then one of those things. If you're on the outside of the curve on one side or the other, then we might pick something different. But even if you pick, let's say you picked moderate plus and I would have picked a high profile for you or vice versa. We're talking millimeters of difference. It is probably not going to make or break your outcome. I promise you. All right. So let's say, what's the biggest difference to you? Like, let's say I am 5'4", 128, and I want, or if I had like a moderate in my body, let's say my left boob is moderate, and this one's ultra high profile. Okay. Tell me your, what the difference visually will be on my left and my right. So my moderate over here. Moderate's on your left, and your high's on your right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry, because I don't know about the mirror image and yeah, stuff like this. I don't know. This oh my God, like, people send me photographs, I'm like, ah, were you in the mirror? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> on the super high profile one, you will not have as much cleavage up top, mm. right? Which seems opposite. I hear people come in all the time. They're like, I really want cleavage. So I picked extra high profile. And I'm like, huh. Because the implant will be shorter and more narrow. So it, it won't, it's going to be out here and not up here and over here. The snow globe. It'll be more like a snow globe than a pancake. That's exactly right. But you have to also realize that everybody's body has differences from side to side that probably are more than a millimeter difference. So it'd be an interesting experiment. Maybe we could do it with you, Jane. Maybe. Um, is, to put, <laughs> is to put a high profile on one side and moderate plus on your other and see if you can tell any difference. That would be Because you might not. You might Don't not. Don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, what else you got? I was just thinking oh, about, okay, the differences between the two. What if, have, has there ever been anyone who would maybe, I've never seen this, but would someone have like a moderate in one and a high profile in the other? Like, would there be anything? In reconstruction, yes. Okay. In reconstruction, I did that a lot. Um, but it was because I'd have a flap on one side and I would put a smaller implant on that side than I would the side that just was an implant only. Um, in, a, in an augmentation, unless there was a lot of asymmetry, I mean a lot, not the average amount like hundreds of cc's difference, I don't find much indication to change the profile on us on one patient, no. What if someone had, again, not sure if this is a thing, could someone have one tuberous breast and one normal breast? All the time. Would that be in, would they have different types of implants? No, I probably wouldn't because often on the tuberous breast side, the breast isn't as big. So I would change volumes, but I wouldn't change profile. Okay. Um, the other thing that I would do with that, the, what the tuberous breast uh, patient is a little bit more at risk for is the double bubble that you asked me about earlier, where her native crease, which isn't, it's not where it should be. It's usually high, um, like up here instead of a round curve down below, it's up here. Especially when she raises her arm up on that side, she may be able to see that old crease a little bit. So she's somebody that I try to pay much more attention to um, release of the fold or the crease that's too high. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that adding another variable in her is to, there's too much difference anyway to then throw yet another difference at it. I, I think. Got it. That is all the questions I had. Perfect, because I think I have a console at two. Oh, and it's two, so it's time to go. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Routon. Thank you, Jenny. It's I good know. to see you, or virtually see you. Virtually. Bye. Bye.